Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you to Central today where we seek transformation through the renewing work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that's what you experience here among God's people today. For the past uh, several weeks, we've been discussing how we develop a heart for God. What does the Lord do within us to, to, to grow a disciple's heart for Him? And this week, that search takes a little bit of a turn, leading us through Lent toward Holy Week. We're going to begin studying selections from the Psalms of Ascent. And you might know that these are Psalms that God's people would sing as they traveled to Jerusalem for feast days, for holy days. These are the songs that they would have sung as they traveled to Jerusalem for Passover. And so we will sing them together. We will study them together as we make our own way toward Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We will sing the songs of the longings of our hearts and bring them to the Lord. This morning we start with Psalm 121, and it sings a very important question. From where does my help come? You ever asked that question? Lord, I'm in trouble. Where's help coming from? I don't see my way through this mess. Where is help going to come from, Lord? Sometimes we think that our help comes from our solid planning. And planning is good. Planning is a wise strategy that the Lord commends, but sometimes planning is not sufficient. Mike Tyson, the champion boxer, was asked a question before he had a fight with Evander Holyfield. And Holyfield was notorious for putting together plans for how he was going to deconstruct the other boxer. And Mike Tyson, in a press conference, was asked, are you concerned about, Mike, about Evander Holyfield's plan? And Tyson replied like this, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> it's true. And life punches us in the face sometimes. And all of our plans, all of our supports, all the, the things that we put together to prop us up sometimes fall apart when life punches us in the face. Because real life with real confusion and real pain is no place for Pollyanna. And it's no place for Pollyanna's faith either. Where will my real help come from? Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see the truth. That we would see and behold Jesus, our help. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will guard your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And our Lenten response to God's word, the Lord teaches the humble his way. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. I lift my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? It's an age-old question, isn't it? As these pilgrims began their journey to Jerusalem, what was, what was in front of them? Well, they, they saw hills. Could be that the hills were where the robbers and the thieves hid. The hills brought danger. It was also those hills that they saw as they traveled to Jerusalem. On the tops of them were the high places and altars to the foreign gods. And so as they journeyed to Jerusalem, they would see all of the dangers of the hills. They would see all of the people giving their hearts to false gods, and they would wonder, where does my help come from? None of these are sufficient for me. Where does my help come from? And maybe you ask that same question. Our world seems to be coming apart at the seams. Where does our help come from? Or my business is flagging. My children are in trouble. My children have wandered away from the faith. Where does help come from? My health is failing. Where does my help come from? 
Who's going to keep me safe when I feel vulnerable? Because none of these things I'm seeing in any of these hills have any help to offer me. But there was another hill that they saw as they traveled to Jerusalem. They, they saw Mount Zion, the hill on which Jerusalem sat, the, the place where the temple was, where, the place where heaven came down to earth and God dwelled in the middle of his people. They saw that hill. They also saw Mount Moriah on which the Lord provided Abraham a ram to be sacrificed instead of his son Isaac. And later generations could see the hill Golgotha where the Lord provided his own son Jesus to be sacrificed for sinners like us, sons and daughters of God here in this room. Who's going to keep me safe, we ask? The answer comes in verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's who. That's where solid help comes from. Look, I want you to look carefully at the text that's printed in front of you. If you look in verse 2, you'll notice that Lord is in all caps. And in verse 5, it's in all caps both times, and same in verse 7, and same in verse 8. Have you ever noticed that before? That sometimes in the Old Testament, Lord is in all caps, and in other times, it's not. That's not a mistake. It's not a typesetter mistake, but rather, when Lord is in all caps, it's how the Bible translators help us to see that here is God's personal name, Yahweh. All caps translates Yahweh, the, the, the name, the personal name, the, the covenant name that God shared with his people as he made promises to them, sealed in blood of the sacrifice. Yahweh was the name that God gave to his people that pledged in life and in death, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's Yahweh. Yahweh, who as the scriptures continue, will reveal him to be a trinity of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. It's Yahweh that's talked about here, the God whom we know, the God who shared with us his intimate, personal name. He is our help. The God who showed us who he is, that one is my help. I remember when a beloved seminary professor whom I'd always called doctor, let me use his first name. I remember when David Calhoun, some of you remember Dr. Calhoun, he worshiped with us here at Central. He was a, a beautiful man, a churchman, a, a gentleman, a scholar, and he was certainly a holy and humble man, and we loved him dearly. And I remember the day after I graduated that Dr. Calhoun asked me to call him David, and it meant something. It meant that there, there was a closeness, there was an affection between the two of us because he told me to call him his first name. That's what God is doing here. The Lord here is saying, in the day of trouble, call out to me whom you know, the God who's pledged in life and in death to save you. Call out to me with names that I've given you for an intimate covenant, blood-bound relationship between you and me because you belong to me. The one who's our help is our covenant to God, the one who promised in blood in that mountain of sacrifice where the temple sits, where God dwells with his people, Yahweh, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the one who's our help. Our help lies beyond the hills to the maker of the hills. And that puts our traumas, our, our, the evil we face, it, it puts our circumstances in an entirely different perspective when we look beyond the hill of danger to see the maker of the hills. Because on one side, we have all of our trouble that's stacked. Our illness, our pain, the thing that's falling apart, the thing that, that never seems to work, the relationship that's, that's failing. On one side, we have that. And on the other side, on our side, is Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. Our side is going to win that battle. That same Yahweh who didn't remain distant but drew close. Yahweh the Son who took on flesh and entered our sinful world, born of Mary. Jesus who came into this world to defeat our sin, to defeat death itself, to defeat the devil. By giving his life on the cross for us, he was raised from the dead in victory over all evil. That Jesus says, I am your help. The one of whom the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1 of Jesus, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him over which he rules. That Jesus rules and reigns over all things. That Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, is your help. Now how does your trouble balance out with the Lord at your side? The maker of heaven and earth at your side. Leslie Newbigin was a 20th century British theologian, and he was a missionary to India. And uh, Newbigin was once asked whether he was an optimist or a pessimist. And that's a fair question, because here's a guy who served in different times in uh, desperate places with disease and innumerable challenges. Here's a man who served through world wars. It's fair to ask that fundamental question, are you an optimist? Do you think the world is getting better? Do you think that tomorrow's gonna be better than today? Are we headed in the right direction or are you a pessimist? Everything's falling apart. And Leslie Nubian answered this way, I am neither. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. That was his hope. That truth is our help. And whether we think the world is getting better, our days are looking up, tomorrow's going to be better than, than today, what difference does that make if our God, if the Yahweh, the one who was reigning and ruling, the one who was raised from the dead, is your help? That one who's come to forgive all of your sin on the cross, to give you eternal life and offer complete healing through the resurrection. The battle has been won because Jesus is raised from the dead. And he's our hope. He's our help. Whatever it is you face today, whatever trauma, whatever tragedy, whatever circumstance, the one who was raised from the dead stands at your side and offers to be your very help and your hope. And he's never too busy to hear from you. He's never too distracted by ruling over the universe that he's unable to hear your cry. We look up to the hills, and where does our help come from? Our help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who took on flesh that we might live. He's the one, he's our help. But how? How's Yahweh my help? Well, we see here written in our text, the Lord, our help, is the one who is our keeper. He tells us this six times. The Lord is our keeper in verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, twice in verse 7, and then in verse 8. He's our keeper. That word means the one who watches over. It's a word that means he's the one who guards. It means he preserves. That word means that he secures That one, your guard, your preserver, your keeper, the one who watches over you, it says in verses three and four, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you, who guards you, who secures you will not slumber. Behold, it says, we could also translate that, look, look, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber, he will never sleep. The one who stands at your side, the one who pledges himself to you, take a look at him. Because he never slumbers. He doesn't sleep. Alexander the Great, the great military general who conquered much of the known world in these days, was asked, how do you sleep in the middle of so much danger? This was a guy who conquered constantly. He had endless military campaigns. He was always under the threat of danger. And he was, how do you sleep in the middle of all that? And his answer was, Parmenes. Parmenes, my guard, stands at the door of my tent. He's always there, so I can sleep because Parmenes is watching. That's great, but you know what? Parmenes had to go to sleep sometimes. As powerful and as strong and as as watchful and as capable as Parmenes was, he had limits. But the one who watches over you doesn't have any limits. Behold, look, He who keeps you, who guards you, who secures you, he never slumbers. He never sleeps. God will never fall asleep at the wheel of your life. 
He doesn't slumber on his people's future. His eye is constantly on his people. Now, I give you, I I tell you, it may seem like God falls asleep at the wheel of your life sometimes. You may wonder, where in the world are you going? But it's impossible for him to do so. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's always alert. He's always on guard, securing the life of his people, his Israel, as he says here. Verses 3 and 4, it's all in plural. His chosen, his beloved people. He keeps us. He guards us because he never slumbers. But you might say, that's great. I'm so glad he watches over us. What about me? Is he so busy with us that he doesn't have time for me? He's so concerned with all of us as his people that I really don't rise to the level of his attention. What about me? Verses five through eight go singular. The Lord, verse five, the one whom you know by personal name is your keeper, singular, your individual keeper. The Lord is the shade on your individual, your right hand. That Lord sees you and he moves close to you because you belong to him. You matter to him. To a people who lived in the desert with constant risk of sunstroke and exposed to the dangers They come out in the moonlight. The Lord is as close to you as the shade on your hand, he says. The Lord isn't distant in the heavens. The Lord isn't hiding in the hills. The Lord has come down to be with you, near you, individual. Yes, you, to secure your life. And we know this even more on this side of the cross and resurrection, that this Yahweh did enter our world, Jesus taking flesh in Bethlehem. He has come to dwell with you alongside you, God with us, Emmanuel, and by his spirit, guarding and keeping you from within you. God has come into your life to keep you from danger. He took on flesh to go to judgment on a cross because of our sin. He entered into our lives and that same God will keep you from all evil, he says in verse seven. He will keep your life Verse 8, he keeps your going out and your coming in from this time forth to forevermore, from your first day to your last day, from sunup to sundown, whenever you leave your home and whenever you return to it again, around the clock, Jesus, who came for you, never takes his eye of protection off of you. It's impossible because he's given his life for you. You might think, really, though? keep from all evil? Have you looked at my life? (laughs) Have you looked at things in my life? I mean, and, and what about in the Bible itself? The psalmist says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That sounds pretty scary and dangerous, doesn't it? Is he kept from evil? The prophets were, were shamed. The prophets were opposed. They were beaten. Many of them were even killed. Are they kept from all evil? How about the Apostle Paul who talks about hardship and persecution and danger and nakedness and sword. He talks about being shipwrecked, about being beaten within an inch of his life multiple times. He was starved. He was robbed. He couldn't even sleep because he was so anxious for all the churches, he told us. How about him? Was he kept from all evil? Think about Jesus. I mean, the only righteous, truly righteous one ever to walk the face of this earth fell victim to the most heinous, unjust act in human history. So he kept from all evil. My life, your life, all the the illnesses, the death, the, the sin within and without, our world falling apart, how are we kept from all evil? How does this make any sense? Well, we're kept from evil by being kept from the dominion of evil. The domination of evil has stopped because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Because there's a new creation. There's new life. There's resurrection power that has broken into this world. Resurrection life has intruded into our messed up world and sin no longer reigns over God's people. Sin no longer reigns over your own heart. The resurrected Jesus does. 
in his power and in his life. So when we look to that hill Golgotha where, where Jesus was crucified for us, we find our sin cleansed. Our sin defeated, our guilt removed, and we look at the empty tomb where new life has begun at Easter. All that resurrection life is offered to you now to break the power of the corruption of sin in your life. The reign of evil has been defeated in Jesus' cross and in his resurrection for us, for you as an individual as well it's as the apostle paul puts it in colossians 3 if you're risen with christ and if you trust jesus you have been if you've been risen with christ seek the things that are above his kingdom his life where he is and practically what that means is we live now as people of his new creation putting aside the bitterness, the malice, the anger, the sexual immorality, the list that he goes through there in in Colossians 3. And instead, we put on all the things of the life to come. We live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We live as we will when he comes again to make all things new. Because Jesus is raised from the dead. Because new life is given to us. We live now as citizens of his kingdom while we wait for it to come in fullness. Look to the hills and we see our help in the Lord who's making all things new and he started with us. He started with us as his people. He's at work because the dominion, the domination, the reign of sin in your life has been broken. He keeps you from all evil. And yet, don't we still feel its presence? We know it's in our lives. We we know it's in this world. And at the same time, there's that new power of Jesus who's laid hold of you and he will never let you go. When you feel threatened, whether it's the threat of the sin that remains in your own life, sin in your own heart, or maybe it's being threatened by sin and evil in this world around us. Maybe you feel untethered from Jesus and you can't just hold on. You feel like you're at the end of the rope. Those are the moments when we need to remember that he never loses his grip on you. Yes, we live in the same fallen world as everybody else. And yet at the same time, every move of your life is made under the preservation of the Lord your God. Every breath that you breathe is with the Lord Yahweh alongside you, with you, and by the Spirit of God within you. That same Lord rules over every occurrence, even the accidents of your lives. Over those the Lord rules and the Lord reigns to keep you and guard you and preserve you and secure you because you are his child being made new. It's true. He keeps us from all evil. Sometimes we sing about it. But sometimes the words just get stuck in our throat, don't they? There are times when, you guys see I'm a pretty emotional person. <laughs> there are times when we're singing and I, I just can't, I can't do it. The words won't come out. Tears, pain, that comes out. But sometimes the words just get stuck. Sometimes we sing it and sometimes we need to hear God's people sing it to us. That's why we gather as a church. That's why we gather for worship. That's why we come in person to hear God's people sing the truth when our hearts are having a hard time believing it, when our lives are having a hard time embracing the presence and the the, the security and the guarding of Jesus. We need to hear the saints of God sing the truth into our hearts. When the words get stuck in your throat, open your ears. And hear the people of God tell you the truth that you're having a hard time hanging on to. You might wonder, well, if the Lord really wanted to protect me, um, I can think of a great way. Why doesn't he just take me out and bring me to heaven? If he really wanted to protect me, then the best way would be removing all the difficulty and the pain and the trial. Why why can't he just whisk me into his presence right now? Because that would feel a whole lot more like protection to me. 
How about you? But he doesn't do that. Because you see, his work of keeping you and me, his dearly loved children in a broken world, he keeps us cleansed from our sin, cleansed from its guilt. He's breaking the, the power, of the corrupting power of our sin. And when he's done that in us, in the middle of a broken world, he offers a testimony that he's on the throne. Somebody else is in charge. Our remaining in this world of sin, living differently, living as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, serve as a living testimony to a better hope. It's so much better than just living with optimism. Things will get better tomorrow. We have a better story. It's better than optimism. Our presence tells the story of Jesus who has pledged to make it all new. And he started with us. Can you see it, world? Can you see the power of this Jesus who stepped into this world? And when we sing in defiance of the hardship of the world, When we sing, we testify that there is a power that is enough to make us alive when everything about this broken world screams death. He doesn't pull us out because in keeping you, in keeping us right now in this world, it shines a light of hope into a dark world. When he keeps us, when he keeps his body, the world has to see his power set on display. Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the face. When this world punches us in the face, what do we do? We sing. We sing songs of deliverance. We sing songs of the Almighty who has the power to keep us in the face of danger and nakedness and swords. That's what we do, we sing. I think if Psalm 121 were translated into a New Testament song, I think it would sound like in Christ alone. I think that's what it would sound like. No guilt in life, no fear in death. The Lord guards my life. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, he keeps your going out and your coming in. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. He keeps me from all evil. None of that can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home from this time forth and forevermore. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That's Psalm 121. Sing it. Sing it to Yahweh. Sing it to one another. And when it hurts too much to sing it yourself, listen. Listen to the saints around you. Testify that the Lord is your keeper. When you can't hang on to him, when you're, when you're at the end of your rope, look to the one who never slumbers and who never sleeps and will not lose his grip on you. Let's pray. Lord, we need Psalm 121 because our world is coming apart at the seams and our lives seem like it does. They do too. There are all kinds of dangers, all kinds of struggles, all kinds of trial, all kinds of evil that we bump into all day, every day. And we desperately need you to be our keeper. So today we lift our eyes to the hills and we see that our help comes from the maker of the hills who took on our flesh that we might live forever with him. Father, help us sing this song. Help us live this life as a testimony for a redeemer as worthy as you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.